last stayed there three weeks earlier, the night before the murder. And the A6 killer had said, call me Jim. And that was the setup. Unlucky was framed. Definitely framed. In 1975, the family thought they might get the case reopened. But an official inquiry by Lewis Horser QC found that the case against Hanratty remained overwhelming. That really broke my father's heart when he, after the Horser report, you know, it was so badly done. You know, it was just a whitewash. James Hanratty Sr. died in 1978. He believed to the end that the whole truth about his son's case had never come out. It would shock if the truth is known. Because it is very simple, the solution. Either James Hanratty is the A6 killer, and I've wasted 30 years of my life, and we're all wrong, or else people are alive today who knew at the time of his execution that he was innocent. John Justice's last interview. He died on July the 1st, 1990. Peter Alphonse still lives in London today. Though he's never provided tangible evidence to support his claims, he's continued to insist that he is the actual A6 murderer, that he began shooting involuntarily. He says that others were also involved. One additional mystery surrounds reports in two national newspapers directly after the trial. Just one week after the A6 killing, Janet Gregston, the dead man's widow, saw a smartly dressed man at a cleaner's in Swiss Cottage, North London. She suddenly announced, that's the man the police are looking for. The papers said that her brother-in-law, William Ewer, followed the man and reported him to the local police. They made inquiries at several shops, including a florist's. The man turned out to be Hanratty. Mrs. Gregston had no connection with Hanratty or the crime. How could she have picked him out of the millions on the London streets a full month before he became Scotland Yard's main suspect? Janet Gregston and William Ewer subsequently claimed the incident had been totally misreported but the journalists involved always pointed to supporting evidence. There is a crucial corroboration between that story and the fact that the police did go to the flower shop. I myself went to that flower shop, 1969, 1970, and I spoke to the manageress that was the same manageress. And she said, yes, we had a tremendous kerfuffle. The police came here, they wanted to know about a young man who'd bought some flowers, and she confirmed that the young man had sent the flowers to Mrs. Hanratty. William Ewer is adamant that Hanratty was rightly convicted. But as years passed, Janet Gregston became increasingly perturbed by the case. She conceded Hanratty was probably not the killer. Last January, while discussing the case with a friend, she had a heart attack and died. It was a, a most tragic ending, what was um, for her a most tragic life. And I do think that the way in which people's lives have been plagued is very much connected with the fact that the, the case went wrong, that there was an injustice here. Well, I think if they got it right, if they had found what had happened, there wouldn't have been the same utter despair and wretchedness which seems to have pervaded the whole case from start to finish. Valerie's story was left paralyzed by the shooting on Dead Man's Hill. Her last public statement was in 1966. She reaffirmed her certainty that Hanratty was the killer. In 1994, a complete submission of fresh evidence was sent to the Home Office. On the basis of that submission, the Home Secretary has agreed to allow DNA testing 
on semen-stained fragments